I'm Jim Collison and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's Call to Coach, Season 5, Episode 16, recorded on May 9th, 2017. Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you have questions during this live webcast, we do have a chat room that's available for you right below the main video window down there. Just click on the login button, bottom left-hand corner, choose the guest account, put your name in where it says guest, and then you can join us right during the live program. If you have questions afterwards or you're watching the recorded version of this webcast, we'd love to have you send us those questions in an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to visit the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com for all your coaching resources and Clifton Strengths training needs. You can also catch the video on both streaming and downloadable audio for offline listening to past programs, as well as all the links to our mobile apps. You can get your top five at your fingertips right there on your iPhone or Android device, all available at our coaches blog. Just go to coaching gallup.com. Sarv Batri is our host today. He works as a strengths evangelist out of our Singapore office. Sarv, great to see you. I'll apologize for my voice. I was out at a, a marathon yesterday screaming in support of all these folks that are running, and I think I screamed my voice right out. But welcome, Sarv. Welcome to another Call to Coach. Thank you so much, Jim. It's so good to be back on Call to Coach, and we are really excited to bring you another version of Call to Coach from Singapore, where interestingly, we have a very exciting co uh, exciting coach today who has joined us in. His name is Brian Ramirez. He is uh, he's basically your Quest coach, who's also a Gallup Certified Strengths coach based in New York City, and has an experience in coaching in North America, Asia, Europe, and Africa. He's founded his company called YourQuestCoach.com which is a coaching practice focused on millennials. And that's what it, today's call to coach is very different because we are, have a coach who is a millennial coach and also has an inside scoop on millennials being a millennial himself. So today we'll get to hear a lot more about, hey, how do I coach a millennial, which is the burning question in today's world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, strength-based development is one of the core pil pillars of his coaching methodologies. He's got a decade of experience in the business world, having worked as a management consultant for a global consultancy and earned an MBA from the University of Texas. Interestingly, um, Bryant grew up in California. He uh, uh, he's, lives in New York City, and currently he's based in the Philippines. So truly, this is a global call to coach right now. So uh, without any further ado, we'd love to welcome Bryant. Bryant, thank you so much for joining us in. We love to start off with hearing about your strengths journey, starting with your top five. Thank you so much, Sarov. Thank you very much, Jim. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, coaching has been an integral part of my development, especially through my MBA years. You really made the MBA mine. So I learned a lot through the coaches that I worked with as I was re-entering the professional world. And one question that I had from my coaches is, how can I bring my true self to the workplace. This is a challenge that I've had in the past as uh, in, my, in my previous career. And I worked with several coaches, worked with faculty advisors. One of my faculty advisors suggested you should look at StrengthsFinder. And uh, so I, I had the book, I actually had the book for, for a couple of years, but it was on my bookshelf. I didn't take the assessment. So I scratched off that uh, code and I took the assessment. Once I took the assessment, the signature themes that came out for me really spoke to me. It was, it, it seemed like this like match that said, how do they know that? <laughs> they figured that one out. Uh, so my top five signature themes are ideation, woo, communication, strategic, and activator. And I, and I see all these working in tandem. Uh, my ideation definitely comes out, especially as I travel right now. I'm effectively a digital nomad. I'm currently in the Philippines, but I was in Singapore last week with Sora and I'll be going to Hong Kong next. So I'm working on my coaching practice as well. Uh, and and uh, I, by being able to see new things and being able to think of new ideas, especially as I gather more experiences, I think it really strengthens my background. Uh, my woo gets me to you know, meet new people. I, I get energized by meeting new people, uh, by learning. It's an opportunity to learn new experiences through others. Uh, my communication, what I realize is that I, I can do the Excel stuff. But my secret sauce is the communication, and it helped me understand that I can focus on that, tap more into my communication. And my strategic, it's not surprising that I was a management consultant in my past. 
uh, that I decided, hey, I'm going to have a strategically minded career. But now as a coach, I can help people in the same ways that I help businesses. And Activator, uh, I, I'm, on, I'm always on the go, 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 go. What's interesting is uh, when I first saw the card, I got, I got my card here and uh, the, the insight card. And one, one of the barrier labels you talked about is impatience and like leaping before looking. And what's interesting is I always saw this as like a strength and weakness. Now I have a better term to identify it. And what StrengthsMinder did was it gave me a new language as a, Sarv Manchor was one of, one, of my, one of my trainers back in, in coaching school. And we talked about and we talked about a new language. And I want to bring this new language to millennials. It's something that I think uh, some people may have heard. But uh, even if they may have heard of it, they may have taken the assessment. They have these five fancy words. They don't know what to do with it. So that's one of the reasons why I decided. You know, I, I devoted my second year uh, as an MBA learning about how I can be the best coach and how I can gather a lot of insights to, to help my future coaches. Thank so, you so much. I see the, yeah, yeah. I know that. So I, the next question I will have for you, especially the listeners want to know more about coaching millennials. So help yeah. us understand what's different about coaching millennials and how do you go about doing that part? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I want to address it in three different areas. Uh, to, and I'll, I'll, I'll share some stories of my background as well. I, uh, I'm not sure if some of you may have heard the term a quarter life crisis. This is a relatively new term. And we've heard of a midlife crisis before. And now uh, millennials are facing this challenge of just right after out of the gates of uh, undergrad, they graduate. And what do they really want to do with their lives? And there's a lot of studies on, on quarter life crises. And, and uh, many folks kind of enter this where they see they have an identity. They think that the, the path they're going on is, is an interesting path but at some point they realize it's not a good fit. One thing that's very interesting about millennials in the millennial era is that you know, we are in an age where information is much easier to get. We're able to get answers immediately. So you go on Google, you, you find something, but are those answers really solutions? So I see that as what's one of my hypotheses of what where, where uh, part of the core life crisis comes in. So I faced a core life crisis a few years ago. I was living in San Francisco. And uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with San Francisco, it's startup capital. And you see a lot of folks doing really cool things. And uh, as somebody who's an activator, as somebody who's a woo, you know, I want to get out there and meet people and do stuff, do cool things. And uh, I was working as a consultant and I wanted to figure out what, what the next step was because I enjoyed learning. And so I'm also a high learner. One of my dominant themes is learner. But I knew that... Uh, I could learn more by doing my own thing or doing something new. So there was a, there was a, a fork in the road. So do I decide, Hey, do I continue as a consultant, but perhaps look at a different area? Now I probably should do something else. Should I get a new job? But yet there's a lot of uncertainty there too. Or should I start my own company? Get even more uncertainty. And also I realized, Hey, I have a GMAT score. That's still valid uh, for another year. And anybody there who's working at business school, take your GMATs early so you can get that out of the way. And I realized, you know, I need to learn more about myself. And the business school experience gave me that opportunity. So I may not even be here in front of you today if I did not go to business school and learn how I can tackle my own quarter life crisis and get out and realize hey, my call to action is to convert what I've learned in the consulting world into coaching. So uh, as Saurav mentioned, uh, and I'm a millennial, who identifies very closely with millennials, but uh, I want to dig in further, get some science out and learn about the millennial mindset because there's ways in which we tick. And Gallup has done a very extensive study on millennials last year. It's called uh, How Millennials Want to Work and Live. So you can take a look at that on Gallup's website. And I plucked out some insights that, that, that really struck out to me. And hopefully this will help you uh, gain more insights on how millennials tick. So uh, 87% of millennials rate professional or career growth uh, and development opportunities as important to their job. It's a lot higher than the 69% of non-millennials. So pretty much it's, it's universal that millennials want to couple their career growth and their, their development of themselves. And what's interesting is that 
there's a perception that millennials may want to just hop around and do their own thing. And, uh, you know, they're not committed to a certain job. And, and really a lot of it doesn't necessarily come from a lack of commitment. It's wanting to see other areas where they can grow. And uh, perhaps that's part of where the poor life crisis comes from. So uh, when, and we discussed this at, at coaching training too, uh, we talked a lot about engagement at work and 55% of millennials say that they're not engaged at work. Now, that's a significant issue. When you're trying to figure out, okay, how, you know, if, you're, if you're working uh, with a manager, say, hey, I have a team, mostly uh, millennials, younger, younger folks, you know, these folks are going to be the leaders of our society. Not too long from now, two years. And the folks now who are in the management positions have a great opportunity to, to help millennials uh, learn, learn key traits, but also need to better understand how we tick so that we can work um, more, uh, more effectively together. So I see a lot of this coaching, not just for millennials, but for people who interact with millennials. That's part of my, uh, my quest to, to learn more and to uh, position my coaching practice as such. So we talked a lot about uh, uh, reframing the way that millennials look at work. Uh, that they're looking at, for example, they, they want a boss who's going to tell them, this is what you need to do today. They want a coach who's going to guide them, but hey, you know, I, I want to do my thing. I'm here to work on some cool stuff, uh, but I, I need a coach. I need somebody who will guide me along the way, be somebody who's supportive. And I don't want to just have an annual review. I, I want to be held accountable. I want to be held accountable more frequently, having more conversations. I had this challenge in my past, where, uh, in my past career, where I would be knocking on the door of my VPs and... Uh, it's not like as if they didn't care, but I think it wasn't prioritized. Uh, hey, let's have this ongoing conversation. And then really the focus on strengths. You know, I, I remember these annual reviews and while, yeah, you talked about what you did well, really be focused on you know, improvement areas and weaknesses. And you know, so as coaches and uh, strengths-based development, we know that we need to focus on strengths. So let's look at strengths. Let's look at how strengths-based development can be geared and framed for millennials. And I'll do this in three ways. I will do this in three ways. Uh, so uh, Gallup has, has extensive study on, on the trends for millennials. Then we'll talk about how we can use strengths innovation. And I'll share uh, at least one of my stories uh, from one of my coaches on how uh, he was able to, to see a new light on his talents as he entered a new, uh, new role. And then also, our own strengths as coaches and how they integrate. So Gallup did, did a study based, they have all, you have all the data on uh, every participant that has taken the, uh, the assessment and they took a sample of, uh, a large sample of that pool. And they noticed that millennials are not totally different than the rest of the population than, than other generations. In fact, three of the five top strengths, if you were to pool all of the all of the uh, folks who take the assessment and then you divide them out by generation. Millennials share achiever, learner, and responsibility at, in their top five as a, an aggregate. So when millennials may be perceived as totally different, well, we want the same things as other people. We may just be framing it differently. And that framing is a very important thing to understand. Uh, how to contextualize uh, how you work with millennials or as a millennial, how you work uh, in, in, in the professional setting. So, but two of these strengths, two strengths have shifted up. And these two strengths that shifted up are empathy and adaptability. Adaptability is not that, uh, not that surprising. Uh, adaptability tends to uh, be more dominant for folks who are younger. So that's not as surprising. I think empathy is the one where you see the thread, where I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. I want to build a purpose and hey, I want to make an impact. That empathy, that empathy is, is a really important one to understand because folks who are millennials, we, I can see this for myself and just as a uh, anecdotal uh, discussion among my, my colleagues and my classmates and talk about, you know, what do I want to do? it really boils down to impact. You know, we're not just looking for a paycheck. We want to build purpose. So we also want to build purpose and help others grow and help others make an impact in their lives. 
So how can we tap into empathy and adaptability? How can we tap into where how millennials have framed their view? You know, as we say, you know, our talents filter our world. So if empathy filters a lot of millennials' world, then we want to understand others better. What's interesting is I had one of my coaches uh, had empathy as 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 number one, and as as I mentioned before, and as we know, you know it's a new language. And my goal is to evangelize this new language to folks who may not be familiar, may not be familiar with the the tools that are already existing, so that they can better identify with themselves. And I say, you know, be yourself with authority. That's that's kind of my tagline and. Uh, my goal there is you already have the innate wiring to be the greatest you if you can tap into it and build authority into it, build intentionality into it, build accountability into it. And one area can turn these five fancy words, five fancy words into a meaningful call to action. So I'll tell you about one of my coaches. He, he had empathy number one. Empathy, number one. And he also had individualization in his top five. And you go through the initial coaching session, first hour. And uh, in the beginning, I asked him, so, so you read through your insight guide. What were your initial reactions to your, your themes? And it was framed to how he can better work with a team that he's about to lead in an international assignment this summer. And he said, I don't see how empathy I don't see how empathy is valued in the business world. You know, it's just, I, I see how it valued you know, in my personal life, but you know, it doesn't seem like, you know, like empathy is something that I see in the business world. And so we discussed how his, his talents, we even went, went through and, and, and understood more about how he was you know, translating the uh, strengths finder talent theme into his own language and his perceptions of business. You know, he said that, Hey, I, I'm, own you know my own assignments i can go heads down but uh it's new having this new role of managing a team of four especially on an international assignment so throughout our session we explored how these themes interact and, and one thing that really fucked out for him was individualization and then i asked him and we, we talked about theme dynamics I will say that uh, the paired up book, I think is one of my favorite books. <laughs> so if you, you know, I, I keep that very close to my, to my, to my chest because, Hey, uh, I, I, I put, put that up on my, on my slide when I'm working with my coaches and you can see the aha. Like, Oh, wow. Yeah. I totally see how that's me. Yeah. That's, that's totally me. And I usually, you know, that's totally me. So for him, once we work through understanding his, his how he identifies with his themes, how uh, the theme dynamics kind of work together. I asked him again later on at the very end. So you know, tell me, uh, empathy, you know, how, how do you see this as valued in business now? And what's fascinating is within an hour, he was able to at least name it and claim it. He said, you know, with my individualization, I can acknowledge the value of each of my team members. I understand how, how each of them can make an impact on our greater goals. And my empathy allows me to see, hey, without me asking them whether something's going right or wrong, I, I could sense it already. And I can sense it based on me valuing each of them. And it's just, it's just really awesome when you can see this transformation called just within an hour. And I, it confirms why I want, I am bu be, I'm building a coaching practice and I'm, and a coach now. So overall, you know, strengths innovation really works. I mean, and I have my own way of doing it. I'm sure everybody has their own style of doing it. And uh, really it boils down to, and you mentioned be yourself with authority, you know, lead your life, lead your life with, with your talents. And, and going back to uh, when I mentioned my, my strengths journey, it helped answer my own question. When I said, I asked my coaches, Hey, how can I be myself, my true self, in the workplace. So I wasn't just compartmentalizing myself, which I did in the past, where my professional self was a bit different than my personal self. Instead, I can be my full self in the workplace or any, any situation. And that's, we need to tap into our strengths as a coach. We need to tap into ourselves uh, and be ourselves with authority. 
And when we have authority, that, that's where we shine as coaches. Millennials aren't these different human beings that come from a different planet and have a totally different way of thinking as much as they frame the world that they see differently. And a lot of it comes with what's available today. You know, when information is available so quickly, we perceive the way in which we use information differently. Brian, so, I just have so to that, say that's so, phenomenal yeah. in terms of the way you've sort of reframed the millennial mindset. And I think it's time yeah. we sort of rebrand or reframe even the word millennials. Maybe we should yeah. call it millennials. you know, feeling millennials. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, I think, one of the biggest insights we've gotten here is that absolutely, I think one of the biggest takeaways is millennials want to be understood. They want to be uh, they want the feelings to be expressed. Now, one of the biggest challenges some of the coaches face, and I've been speaking with a lot of them, again, around coaching the millennials, is how do you get them to act? How do you get them to change their behavior for them to be yeah. really powerful in the way they apply it? So how yeah. do you do? What's your style of getting them to act and change behavior? You know, it's all about action. You know, as a business person, I'm always driven by action. I'm solutions oriented. I want to get going. My activator is really high. And my way of looking at it is all about reframing how you're looking at your goals in life and where you want to go and broadening that. So, for example, one of the things I studied in my MBA is creativity theory, innovation theory. And we talk a lot about, you know, when you were younger, when you were three years old, you're asking, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And a lot of, you know, you can be an astronaut, firefighter, perhaps a president of the United States, you know, I suppose anything was possible. Anything was possible then. And then as we go through uh, life as a, you know, a childhood, we start to think more logically and we start to think, hey, you know, I'm, I'm really slated for a few things and very practically. And while there's, a, of course, a lot of value to that, what I want to do is unbuckle, unbuckle the notions, unbuckle uh, that, the notions that, hey, you have to be something that's pr just practical. Money. And I call these quests. I call these quests, this way of reframing the opportunities we have in life. And the definition of quest is an act or instance of seeking, pursuit, search. And it's about the journey. I mean, we may have heard something uh, before. You may have heard this before. The effect of uh, it's about the journey, not just the destinations. Another insight that I have is, you know, you go on Facebook and, or any social media platforms. And one thing that you see is, is people post stuff to validate what they're doing and effectively it's like a, a destination you're almost forcing to have a destination and get some validation and while there may be value to that when we're overly focused on the destinations we lose track of the growth opportunities in the journey in the quest now one of the books i brought i brought up uh, in, in coaching training and it's, it's by far the most important book that i've read over the last couple of years called the power of now have you guys read the power of now it's by eckhart tolle and then the point is live in the now you know, he has a lot of great insights here, and I highly suggest people will take a look at it. Uh, I, I, I use this in my coaching training. I bring, I bring up the power of now because to me, I, I have many times focused on too much in the future or being too practical, thinking, okay, in order to get there in the future, or what do I need to do? And almost obsessing, see, as Eckhart Tolle mentioned, obsessing with, with that or obsessing with the past. And, and today, I, I do my best, I try my best to live in the now while also keeping track of where I need to go and keeping the learnings in mind in the past. So how do I do this? How do I make this? How do I go through a quest? So I'll give you a couple stories here. You know, some interesting things. One of my best friends unintentionally went on a quest. Right? I, I never expected this because I knew him. He's very big on you know, law. He studied for his JD. So he went, he went and got his JD. And in the, in, in the beginning of that time period for him, he was also uh, helping his friend uh, with, with, his, with his game. So his friend was building a, a Facebook game. And say, hey, can you test it out? Hey, my friend's a gamer. So I was like, okay. So he was building his friend. And at some point, uh, as he was in law school, uh, his friend said, hey, do you want to help me build out these games? You know, it seems like you, know, you like doing this stuff. So in tandem, he was in law school and helping his company, helping his friend start a gaming company. And once he finished law school, instead of becoming a lawyer, he decided to move to San Francisco and 
help help continue build out this gaming company. And I, I would not have expected him to not only become an entrepreneur, but have this focus in games. And at some point, they sold their company for nine figures. And it was, a, a, I mean, it was just so transformational for him. I call him the accidental entrepreneur. Now, that, might, that quest, if he didn't just say, hey, like, yeah, sure, I'll help out in uh, testing out your games. Yeah, no, no problem. Like, we'll see where that goes. I don't think he thought of much more than that at the beginning. And these are the things we can do. We, we, can, we can strive to uh, reframe how we're looking at making progress, not just in the practical, which is very important. Don't get me wrong. It's very important. So one of my quests to, uh, it's not the, it, I don't say it's a practical quest. I'd say it's more of extremely ambitious. Uh, one of my uh, biggest influences is Bono. So, uh, and you too. And uh, I want to become Bono. It's one of my quests to become Bono. And let's look at Bono. He had to learn how to sing. He had to learn how to write songs with meaningful messages and something that captivates his listeners and his audience and build stage presence. And then eventually he built capital to be able to interact with many important people in the world. So, how can I learn from that? How can I take that one example and say, okay, if I want to become Bono, whether or not I become Bono or not, it's not the a point. What actions can I learn from, from that example? So for example, yeah, you can probably sing in the shower and many of us probably do. I've gone on stage at a karaoke, at a karaoke bar in front of 200 people and just sang in front of 200 people, 200 strangers. And that's an important skill. It's, you know, you're building stage presence. You're building you're, my woo, very high woo, uh, very high command there. So I'm practicing my strengths intentionally while also doing something fun and doing something that, hey, those skills translate directly with anything you do in your career as well as building social capital. And then what if I went further and wanted to bring a message to an audience just like Bono does through his songs being on this podcast is part of the quest. Uh, this is my first podcast, and I expect to do more podcasts through uh, your quest coach. And I want to bring this message out to greater audience who may be lost, may, may be able to, to gain some insights. This is part of my quest. This is a, a tangible action that I'm doing to, to learn more and to bring value out. So it's a reframe. This is a reframe. It's not anything new, in my opinion. I don't think this promotion is new, but it's a way in which I'm packaging up how you can envision where you wanna go. And whatever that may be, whatever that ambitious goal is, you can design the life that you want. And by doing so, that big ambitious destination may not be the most important aspect here. It's the journey along the way, building the life di the direction, seeing, that you can move forward towards an ambitious goal, whether or not you achieve it, so that you can learn along the way. And uh, that's my way of, of framing uh, to millennials uh, actionable steps that they can take to, to grow. And I'm sure everybody will come up with their own, with their own version. Their own quests as well. So Brian, thank you for that quests, one. Yeah. Um, quick question around that. So um, there are a lot of millennials who may be listening to this podcast. Um, what is your advice and recommendation for them if they want to pursue coaching as a career? That's something that you have done yeah. and you sort of plunge in this, yeah. right? And that's some of the biggest, um, I would say, skepticism they have is, hey, would I be successful in this? How would they build coaching as a quest in their life? It's a very, very good question. When I approached my coaches and, I, and once it kind of dawned on me, oh, coaching is an interesting area. Why did it become interesting? Because... I've always had an interest in professional development, personal development. I've started uh, multiple mentoring programs in my past at UCLA. Back when I was working consulting, I started a mentoring program at the firm, started a nonprofit focused on mentoring through storytelling. So I've always had this, this knack, but I knew that, okay, I can do these mentoring programs. There's value there, but can I be the change agent myself? And to me, coaching allows me to be the change agent. And I need to understand how am I going to frame this? How am I going to approach this and be, and, and what's my value proposition essentially? 
And as, as you mentioned earlier, and I'm a millennial, I understand millennials and I'm learning more about how we tick, better understand how we tick and then make actionable steps. I need to figure out that value proposition. So first and foremost, if you're thinking, uh, if you're in your 20s, your early 30s, you're saying, hey, you know, I want to be I'm thinking about coaching. What is your value proposition? What makes you, what, what is your style? And you're going to learn a lot about that through your themes, through your dominant themes. You can learn a lot about that, but you have to articulate that for yourself. And then when I went to my coaches and asked them, hey, you know, it's really daunting. It's a really daunting uh, endeavor because as you alluded to earlier, many, most coaches are probably later in their career. So I'm much earlier in my career. How do I build credibility? And one of my coaches says, well, so what do you want to do with this? I think I'll maybe make a, I'll make a blog. I'll, I'll do some podcasts. I'll put a lot of content out there and I'll work with individuals. I'll get some cert certification and I'm so happy to be a Gallup certified strengths coach. And she said, well, think of like all the other bloggers out there, all people doing podcasts. What, what is their credibility? And once I dug in and say, hey, you know, I got high woo, high communication. It's credibility is important. I have an MBA, so it's not like as if I don't have the education. But it's tapping in these talents that's going to give me the best leg up. That's where I start seeing that's my value proposition. That's where I can make an impact. That's where others can lean on, okay, hey, you know, perhaps I should tune into Brian, maybe learn some, learn something new. Uh, so you tap into that value proposition. And Thank you, Brian. We, we did we learn ability. something new. We did learn something new. So that was really phenomenal. Right. Really appreciate that. Um, Jim, any questions from your side here? Yeah, you know, one of the things, Brian, one of the things you said um, just really kind of set with me And when you were talking about fear, millennials and fear, right? And, and how fear gets in the way of creativity. You know, when, when we think yes. when we're kids, right, we have no fear of failing. We'll just do stuff. And if it fails, we just move on to the next thing. Right. So, yes. Hey, I, we don't know. I mean, I remember as a kid, I thought I would thought I could build my own rocket, right. That I thought, you know, let's put some <laughs> yeah. things together and I will put some batteries in it. And if I light those batteries on fire, that's a bad decision. Right. But it was one of those things like I was, I was not afraid to fail. And, and I think sometimes when we think, and, and I'm, a, I'm a father of five millennials at this point, right? I have <laughs> kids that are all in that bracket. And, and I kind of understand the, the fear that's out there because there's the expectations are high and the, you know, you, the, the pressure to perform and you got to get through school and you got to get the right degree and then you got to get in the right business. And you lived in the Bay Area. You understand how hard that startup pressure is that you got to have the right... <laughs> project doing the right thing right yeah. as you think about money so can you talk a little bit about in in your experience and working through this how do we recreate yeah. for the millennials for anybody to be honest right i i kind of think we're all millennials in our in our own way right we all have these same fears but can you talk a little bit about how do we overcome or how do we use these themes how have you seen to, to yeah. really start breaking down that fear barrier so that people can be creative and can be yeah. successful and, and aren't afraid. Can you talk a little bit about that? I'd love to. And I agree that we all are living in the millennial era, regardless of what generation you identify with. Right. My mom, when my mom started using Facebook, probably more than I use Facebook, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> what's going on here? You know. So, and I was one of the first users of Facebook. So, Absolutely. How can we bring in creativity aspect? And so one thing that I do in my coaching practice is I bring in design thinking methodology. So for those who may not be familiar with design thinking, <clears throat> the focus on design thinking is to solve problems based on what humans need rather than to a tech spec or a requirement setting, for example, uh, in, my former, in my former career. So you, a lot of, it just starts with empathy. <laughs> that's the first stage it starts with empathy so when you're just when you're asking about you know how can we start tackling this fear first it's empathizing with yourself and understanding how am i framing my world how am i using my talents or or, or not using my talents uh, to to 
in whatever way I'm, I'm, I'm going forth. So whether it's choosing a major, right? I remember that, that you have to choose a major, you got to choose, okay, what, what am I going to recruit for? You know, something as very practical as that, or even your hobbies or even your friends, you're building a, you say now, you know, your, your friends are your family. You know, you, they're an extended part of your family, you know, you, family that you choose. So all of those decisions you got to make, it's, it's very, over, it can be very overwhelming. And what I want to do is start breaking down, okay, what these attributes, we start with empathizing with yourself. And then you go forth with the process. One area that, it, that's uh, it's in one of the stages of design thinking is called prototyping. So essentially, when you start to prototype, you start to understand a different way of doing something. So an easy example may be having a, a, a conversation with somebody who has a job you may want, but focusing on their stories, their insights, their experiences, or doing that, doing that experience that you may want, a project, it could be an externship, an internship, et cetera, uh, or, or even a hobby. Brian, let me let me as you as you talk about that, let me bring into you know you, you yeah. mention you also mentioned mission and purpose, yeah. and it being a really important part of of this kind of this millennial thought. Can you can you talk a little bit about how someone could use mission and purpose? You used the word prototyping just a second ago, but as yes. you've watched people that you're working have have they've used mission and purpose to do that prototyping? In other words. I might want to try some things that feel really good and go different places and help people do things. How can we use those experiences to really discover some of those things that we're best at? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that, that's where that, that empathy phase, you need to essentially build a vision for yourself. And what's your vision statement? What's your value statement? Just like any company has a mission statement, a purpose statement, a, a value statement. So as you, I, I, I totally agree with you that uh, you need to first understand your mission, understand where, what value you want to add and in what way. And the, the, the strengths themes become an integral part of that language. They become an integral part of the language. You can, you can write your resume, your cover letter with, with, that, with this language but you need to start out with yourself and identifying that. And then those, then you, then you glean insights there and then it, it turns into prototyping activities. It turns into what could be your future job, what could be uh, your future opportunities. As, as you were talking uh, in pre-show, we were talking a little bit about, you know, you are, and I forget the term that you used as you go from place to place. What, what did you call that? Uh, digital nomading. <laughs> there you go. Digital nomading. It's great. You get a lot of different experiences in, you know, I've told my kids if they ever get a chance to travel, go overseas as part of their schooling, that I, that's yeah. super valuable. And because you get to see how other people live, you get to see how other cultures live and it's just a valuable, you know, very valuable experience. I think sometimes yeah. as we're searching for those, those things that we're best at, um, volunteering or taking, you know, taking jobs in different countries or doing some things that are outside of your comfort zone. And then really exploring the different opportunities in these jobs because it's hard to fail. Like when you're helping people, nobody goes, stop doing that, right? <laughs> it's hard to fail yeah. in, those, in those areas yeah. where you're volunteering or you're helping. And, and I really encourage folks to expand and explore all the different ways of, you know, you think even in nonprofits, they need help with accounting, right? They need, sometimes they need help with planning. Sometimes they need event planning. Sometimes they need selling, right? And there's all these different areas that exist in the business world that 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 um, people can get a good shot at in a nonprofit or in a you know whatever an experimental. Even in your nomading, I bet you're learning things as you're you're in the Philippines now, but you, you know you're 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 going to be jump hopping. I bet as you jump, you learn things. You learn different things all the time. It, it, do you find that to be the case? Oh, that's the reason I travel. The number one reason I travel, I've traveled to 55 countries, six continents so far, one planet so far, we'll see you know, if there's any planets that open up. And it's about the learning experience of the people and the environment. Uh, and it, it adds to what I call a uh, palette of experiences. This is one reframe where I, I see everything that I do, 
everything that I experience, anything I observe, another part of a new part of my palette. Just like a painter has a palette. It's a new shade, a new color. And that's that when you, when you mentioned you, I would encourage everybody to study abroad. If you're, if you're in undergrad, I, I encourage my sister to go study abroad. That was the one requirement I had. It's like, you're going to study abroad. I studied abroad and, and travel on your own. Uh, do it however you want. My MBA was half traveling. <laughs> I think many of us who, who uh, are MBAs may have traveled a lot. And uh, a lot of it is just uh, the learning that you get from traveling, the learning that you get from exposure. And uh, also working on something in tandem. I think that's also kind of a difficult concept for people to understand because they think, oh, I'm just on a holiday. But I'm, I spent a week in Mumbai earlier this year with Sorov. And it was one of the most impactful weeks I've had in, in years to learn about strengths-based development, how I can be able to coach. And I was around folks. Yeah, well, I was around folks who were in Mumbai or who, uh, who are in India. We learned from each other through that experience. So I wouldn't have had that if I didn't go to Mumbai and if I didn't learn, uh, if I didn't learn there. Thank you, Brian. So the advice yeah. from your quest code, Brian Traminus, is, is <clears throat> learning is a journey, but also a journey can teach you a lot of learnings. Thank you so much, Brian, on that. Jim, back to you. Yeah, okay. let me ask. S SP had a question in the chat room. We have picked up a couple folks okay. in the chat, so this is pretty cool. Great. SP, it Great. asked, where's individualization for you? So as you think about your coaching and you're working with people and you think about empathy and, and some of those pieces, where does individualization fit in your all 34? And how, are, are you using that to really dig in on people? Mm -hmm. uh, totally. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, uh, I think, number eight or nine. So it's one of my dominant themes. And I'm what I do is I, I have a, a method that I'm building out. And each time I have a coaching session, it, it adds to that palette of experience I mentioned earlier. But I focus totally on that one individual. I take what I've learned. I take, I take what, we, you know, what we learn as coaches and, and tailor the session to them. Especially as we have multiple sessions, I, I try to pluck out certain tools and the, certain areas where I can say, okay, let's focus on this. Uh, areas where they may not have noticed. So yeah, absolutely. Individualization is, is a critical aspect. Brian, do you find that um, the, 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 the face of coaching, the way we coach, you know, today we kind of think of it like a, it's a phone call or it's a video, you know, some people are dabbling in video conferencing and doing those kinds of things. But as you think of this nomad idea and being, uh, you know, oh, by the way, and we also think of coaching being once a week for whatever reason, right? It's a, it's a, you know, it's this regular whatever, once a month, whatever that is. Do you find that's taking on a little bit of a different flavor as you have a group of people, you know, think of the gig, the uh, gig economy where people may have three or four different jobs, right? They, they, they yeah. may be doing different pieces of different jobs. Are you finding that the coaching is taking on a little different flavor and that it's not just the phone call once a week or once a month, whatever that is, but it may be more frequent sometimes and less frequent others. And it may take on a different um, kind of a whole different construct when we think of coaching. Uh, yes. Now, because we have so many tools, you know, everybody has WhatsApp or you know, Google Hangout and you can easily send a message. Or you can easily send a video message so that we can talk asynchronously. asynchronously. We don't have to get on a phone call to, to, to hear my voice, to hear their voice, to be able to interact in that way. So I, I, that's what I've done. I've, I've, I've used asynchronous forms of communication. I've also used Google Slides. Google Slides is one of my best friends because you can collaborate. We can, we can do this at the... Same time, real time, they can be on the slide, I can be there, they'll type something in, and I can see it as they're speaking. So I, I'm, I'm integrating certain things, certain technologies, uh, so that it helps bridge the communication. It's not just, here's one week or two weeks, and then we'll stop here. And that, and that, that line is always open. Yeah. And, and I wonder if it's stretching out the coaching conversations. So instead of it being a 30 minute, you know, we bill on 30 minute increments and we're going to start a conversation and a conversation. Um, you know, one of the things uh, my family uses a lot of, we've been using, of course, Facebook Messenger. And so we're all there yes. using that. But recently I've started using Boxer, B-O-X-E-R with my wife. Uh -huh. And it's, it's audio conversations like a walkie talkie, but they can be done. Yes. 
Uh, they can be done anytime. They can sit for long periods of time before you pick them up. But or it can be real time. Commu- not it's very very close to real time communication. But it, yeah. you know, someone can leave a message. So do you see? Do you think you see like the future? Maybe not for everybody, but do you think in some situations, instead of it being a thirty minute conversation on Thursday, that we're we're having these mini conversations. E- even here at Gallup, we're talking about the state of the manager changing from having an annual performance review to having these mini interventions, these mini conversations that go on throughout the, you know, at the day. Do you see that same kind of trend? Do you think that will stick in coaching or that it's, that, that'll be the future of coaching when we think about millennials? I think it has to, especially as uh, attention spans become a lot shorter. Uh, we, we have to have more forms of asynchronous communication. You know, we're, uh, it's, it's difficult. It's more and more difficult to just schedule a slot and keep that slot. Um, so even, even when it comes to the consultation portion, I encourage uh, asynchronous communication because then instead of, you know, and, and that, that portion, you know, as, as coaches, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to, to sell your coaching, trying to, to, to give your pro- value proposition there and them to get to know you. But at the same time, that's a significant investment in, in the, in your time. So uh, I, I think you can, you, you have to start using asynchronous communication some way and be comfortable with the fact that you may not be on the phone and it's real time, but, but, but doesn't replace real time. In fact, I, I try my best to not just use a phone. I use video chats so that it replicates as much as I can of a real uh, or in-person situation or in-person session. Yeah, Trish, Trish Ward in chat. It doesn't replace oh. it. Yeah, no, no. It doesn't replace it. Right on. In, in fact, in, even in, as I manage interns all around the world here, um, we I always insist video whenever possible. And yes. I get very frustrated when we can't, you know, for whatever reason we can't do it. Kind of the backup becomes audio. But I think yes. in this disconnected, um, you know, in this dis- disconnected world that we live in, it's even more and more important that we do spend that face-to-face time. There's an old, there's an old, uh, I think it's United Airlines from the 70s commercial where the boss comes in and he, he says, we've gotten too far away from our customers. And he starts handing everybody plane tickets. And he says, we're going to stop using the phone. You know, this was video conference wasn't even around yet. Stop using the phone. We're going to go visit them in person. And I do think even in this world of macro, like Trish says, macro coaching, she, she puts in there, she's kind of yeah. quoting what we were just talking about. I do think there's an enormous amount of power in person. Don't you think we still, I mean, there, you mentioned you, you went and saw Sarov in Mumbai, right? Or, or wherever you guys met. And that's a powerful, impactful relationship moment when you're in person. Mm-hmm. Can, you, can you talk a little bit about that, that in person, how you see that? Well, that's, uh, <clears throat> I met with Sarov last week in, in Singapore. We could have easily done a video chat, I'm sure. But I asked specifically for, uh, if, we, if Sorrell can be you know, my, my strengths coach and uh, to see him in person there. It was that, it, the in-person is extremely important. Uh, but it's, it's one where, you know, we have to understand the limitations, especially in time and we wanna start immediately. So uh, unfortunately, I think in-person is becoming more of a luxury. But I think that luxury is important yeah. to keep. And yeah, I, I always encourage if it's possible, if it's possible. And Jim, we've been working a lot with technology companies, especially building coaching cultures, uh, management. And what we've been seeing is as technology takes over the world, you know, uh, the importance of being human becomes even more critical in the, in the future. So, and that's why I think coaching plays a huge role of the world uh, has to unleash is truly the human connection between people. And that in-person coaching plays a huge role in that part. Yeah, I just think it's icing on the cake. And uh, although icing isn't always uh, isn't always mandatory, <laughs> so maybe that's a bad example. Um, because I th- I think it is really important, even in this, um, because we're moving around so much that we stay connected in a way that we're in different cities. I, I have a, a friend tomorrow night. I'm meeting for dinner. I haven't seen him in 20 years. And uh, and he, you know we connected through uh, Facebook Messenger, and he's like, "Hey, I'm going to be in Omaha. Let's get together." And I don't think you can miss as a coach. I don't think you can miss those kind of opportunities when you get when you're in that city that with those clients. You got to take advantage of all that time. I travel out to DC. I'm stationed or I live here in Omaha, but I travel out to DC, and man, I pack 
that I have three, if I'm out there for three days, I pack every second and I pack it with not phone calls, not video conference, but I try to meet with the people that are in that, you know, in that city while I'm there. It's just a really, really important. Um, I think that face to face is super important. Okay. Last question. Cause we're going to run out of time. Uh, SP had asked, have you ever used mapping programs for concepts or to map out a goal in relation to the slides for visualization um, to help in addition to the video in the chat? So if, Brian, have you used mapping programs to, to map out those concepts? Uh, are we talking about like Visio, for example? Like, it's, uh, I mean, I'm not sure what, but, but in terms of you, if you're talking about like building out a process or building out, I mean, I think a Google Slides, like what, what the tools that are just in Google Slides is already enough for me to, to, to help build out a visual, I'm talking about a visual. Uh, but there is a lot of easy tools out there that are free that don't require any extra, you know, any, any extra effort. Yeah. And there's some like great ones that aren't free yeah. that, <laughs> that, uh, that folks can use too. And we think, you know, and, and Brian, everybody comes at this a little bit different uh, when you think about it from a coaching standpoint and some, everybody preps a little bit different. So of course you're, I hear what you're saying. Use those tools. Sorry if we're about to uh, run out of time. Yeah. Uh, why don't you help us wrap this up? Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Jim. Thank you, Brian. And we really want to appreciate bringing a new flavor to our, uh, to our call to coach around coaching millennials and being a millennial itself. You know, I'm sure there's a, there's a beautiful journey ahead of you. We talk about 10,000 hours of effort uh, in becoming an expert at what you do and you've started early. So that'll really help you, you know, be a coach of the future. Like I said, people want to be like you talk about being Bono, uh, being a part of that U2 uh, gang. I think people will Look to this podcast maybe 10 years from now and they'll think about, I want to be like Brian. So thank you so much for setting the example <laughs> for the millennials out there and really coming on this show. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so Jim. much for inviting me. Thank you so much. No, Brian, great to have you. In the 80s, we would have said, got to be like Mike, right? So that's the, uh, every yeah, generation yeah, has, yeah. Their, <laughs> has their Michael Jordan, so to speak. So we'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we have available at the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com. Send us your questions, comments. If you'd like to be a guest blogger, if you got something in your head you want to write for us or are looking for four to 600 words, some original work, you got something you want to send in, send it to us, coaching at gallup.com. Uh, Bryant, maybe you could even, uh, if you got a four to 600 words in your head, if you want to be a guest blogger, that would, uh, we'd love to have you. I would you love submit. to. Love to have you I would submit. Love to. Write that out, send it to coaching at gallup.com. And you can also catch the recorded video and audio of this program as well as all the past ones and a ton of resources now on our coach's blog, just coaching.gallup.com. Don't forget, we have a bunch of other podcasts available for you as well. Of course, uh, uh, the one actually gets way more views than this is our theme Thursday. So we'd love to have you go out there and uh, view or download or listen to or subscribe. We also try to get this in front of you in every possible way to get it done. And so if you haven't figured out how to subscribe, head out to coaching.gallup.com and click on the resources tab. Everything is listed right there. If you found this helpful, we'd ask that you share it. And we, this one's really going to be helpful for you. We'd ask you to share it, share it around your social networks. And uh, with that, we'll say goodnight, everybody. <laughs>